moderator who is known to be Dr. Al Tumeni. He had been the second president of the Southern Philippine Agribusiness and Marine and Aquatic School of Technology from 2010 to 2017 and had other various work experiences from the local government posts prior to his presidency. He was a consultant of Mindanao Development Authority in establishing the Mindanao Knowledge Center, which is a mechanism and a loose academic network to pull Mindanao on experts from various fields who could provide evidence-based studies for policy makers and decision makers. He also have other consultancy works and experiences to name a few at uh, USAID or Be Leaders Project on scaling up renewable energy projects in Mindanao and with other network and associations such as Philippine Agroforestry Education and Research Network, Philippine Association of Agriculture Educator Educators Incorporated, and uh, Conserving Farming Movement Incorporated as a member, and uh, also at the uh, Global Cooperation Society. So Dr. Al graduated with a BS degree in agribusiness as cum laude and master's in science degree in agriculture major in agronomy and his uh, doctorate of philosophy is in horticulture. Without further ado, let us all welcome our moderator for this session, Dr. Alexander M. Campanel. Okay, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> we're just through with our biological actions. So we're now ready to tackle uh, the local actions for Mindanao in relation to how it navigates uh, to the challenges of the new globalization. We have four equally competent speakers, homegrown, and of course, Mindanawan, by residency or because of their home uh, or their workstations. Uh, the four resource persons will present their paper for us to know what are some basic and fundamental issues and information that could help us plan and strategize the roadmap for Mindanaoans' contribution and positioning ourselves towards globalization. As the moderator of this afternoon session, um, we will follow the same procedure as uh, what was uh, practiced earlier. After the four presenters, we'll, we'll have a time for the open forum. So, first topic to be delivered this afternoon, entitled Sustaining Environmental Integrity Amid the New Globalization. Our speaker finished her BS, BS Chemistry and BS MS Chemistry degree from the Ateneo de Manila University as a DOEC scholar. She served as an instructor at her alma mater before obtaining the doctorate degree in environmental engineering from the Wa Washington State University and work as an environmental engineer at Ashworth Leninger Group in Tamarillo, California. She came back to Ateneo de Manila University as balik, balik scientist of the DOST and assisted in the new BS 
environmental science program of the university. In 2016, the environmental science department was established in the same university and she has been the department chairperson since then. She is the consultant for Clean Air Asia, where she was involved in clean air for smaller cities in the ASEAN region. She is currently involved in the integrated program for better air quality project. Our first speaker for session two this afternoon is Dr. Doris Montecastro. Good afternoon to all. Mahayong hapon. So just so you don't get confused, because I think in the introduction, it may mislead you to think I'm from Ate I'm with Ateneo. I used to be with Ateneo de Manila University, but in 2014, I came to Davao City to help with the new environmental science program. So I am now a Mindanaoan. <laughs> I've been, this is my sixth year in Mindanao. Um, and so when Sheila invited me to give this talk, she asked me uh, specifically to include the study that Atene de Davao conducted on uh, geomapping and land suitability. Yeah. So what's in this new globalization? I think this morning we've been told that um, there are, we're in the new wave, the postmodern wave, wherein our people are being considered global citizens. And there are also new economic opportunities because the global markets have opened for us. Unfortunately, it can also lead to some inequitable opportunities. And I think uh, Dr. Briones mentioned earlier another problem, another global problem, which is climate change. So the global warming issue, this has often been referred to now as the new normal. And people's frameworks have not, some have not yet incorporated this. So I guess this afternoon, that's really part of the message that I want to impart. So. Is it working? So the study was uh, funded by the University Research Council of Atene de Davao University, but the actual proposal was a brainchild of discussions with state universities, so SUCs and higher education institutions in Mindanao, in some forum organized by MINDA. So it was agreed upon that Ateneo de Davao will conduct the pilot study in Mindanao, in Davao City, so as to formulate the framework and the methodology in the hope that the scope will be expanded to the rest of Mindanao. So it's basically a pilot study with Davao City. Sorry. So what are the objectives of the study? It's mainly to characterize the land area in Davao, in s Davao City, in terms of land use, soil attributes, and the uh, agroecological zones to generate the spatial database and provide updated data to serve as basis for further research and development. So the study area was basically initially to identify 10 barangays out of 180 something in Davao City based on the barangays involved in agriculture and the selection was based on the largest land area. Unfortunately, in during the study, two barangays were we were not advised to go there due to peace and order issues. So we ended up with just eight barangays. And the, in order to come up with the agroecological zones, certain data are procured. 
uh, some are uh, from satellite data, and others, uh, we bought a drone in order to conduct some aerial mapping. So some we had to purchase some satellite images in order to conduct the study. And with a drone, um, we can determine the crop health as well as uh, provide the geographical information system data. Soil samples were also collected at those eight barangays and some on-site information um, were determined. The soil samples were also brought to the lab and analyzed for certain nutrients, usually NPK, uh, pH, and also the soil characteristics like sizes so that um, we can determine what type of soil is present. But I suppose the most important aspect of the study was conducting the focus group discussion and key informant interviews, including community mapping. So um, at the bottom there, you can see people looking at something. Um, our environmental science students, because they have a GIS class, uh, they were asked to help produce the map, the topographical map of each barangay. So they have a large map because for some of you, probably you used to do this using Manila paper, you know, the community mapping, just drawing things. But it's so much easier now with technology. Um, the, our students were able to have the map and then it's a huge tarpaulin type map that they can write on. And so it was used for uh, validating data, especially the ground truthing, because uh, if you're familiar with satellite data, usually you have one information for the whole of Mindanao. Do they need to downscale it to have a better resolution. And so the information, you might think because it's high tech, it's highly accurate, that's not necessarily true. Uh, many will have a single data for a big scope or location, and so you have to do some more processing. So ground truthing is always import an important activity in using remote sensing data. So what results did we obtain? So from data on elevation and slope, you were able to determine the topography for Davao City. So the one you see in the map is the whole of Davao City. And if you're familiar with Davao City, uh, on the left side, the western side, uh, those are really more in the mountain area. And then the southeastern side is more the coastal area. And then from the soil classification, so from the soil data, as well as topography, the agroedaphic zones were obtained. Uh, these agroedaphic zones, they are basically um, providing information based on soil characteristics, uh, what kind of vegetation, what plants, what crops, can such soil types uh, support? Because as mentioned earlier by Secretary Piñol, uh, you know, the what are the three things necessary? You need sunlight, you need the soil, and you need water. The soil is the, the supporting matrix for agriculture. And then um, temperature and moisture index information provided the basis for determining the agroclimatic um, zone. So mentioned earlier, the su the sunlight, uh, the the heat. It's not just the sunlight, but the heat and the water. Um, they provide the 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 needed factors for plant growth. So you need to know uh, what areas can support based on the moisture content and the heat, because plants tend to 
grow within a narrow range of temperature. For instance, cacao, I think it likes 21 to 23 degrees. And then it requires certain uh, moisture content of the soil. So once the agro edaphic zones and agro climatic zones were obtained, uh, they're overlaid. So if you're familiar with GIS, this is really just mapping. So the information is combined. And so what is obtained is the agroecological zone. So there are actually four. So the study um, got four agroecological zones in Davao City, Acrisol, Nitosol, Glaisol, and Cambisol. And for each zone, uh, they tend to support certain crops, like in Acrisol, the upland rice, paddy rice, soybean, maize, groundnut, cassava, tea, coffee, rubber, pineapple, sugarcane, banana. So there, um, each type will support certain types of crops. Um, what we also found is that certain zones require particular uh, management. So only um, certain areas are very suitable. So the one that's colored green, those are the areas that's very suitable for agriculture. And then, uh, so they're more on the south, southeastern side, which I mentioned is more like the coastal areas. So they're more down slope. Uh, the upland areas, although they can support agriculture, but they require intensive management. And uh, on the eastern side, northeast, uh, they require special management. So the land use of certain areas in Davao, uh, this information is not taken into account in conducting the agricultural um, business. So uh, what are the key findings of the study? So. I think these were also mentioned earlier, but our study also uh, found these, that farmers tend to grow only crops through soil conditioners, fertilizers. So if you just plant something and not add fertilizers, you're not going to get good results. So um, organic farming is also included here. So the addition of soil conditioners or fertilizers is needed in order to grow the crops. And often it's market driven. So the crops that are sellable, that will bring profit are the ones chosen. So there, there's no consideration of whether the soil type is suitable for that particular crop. And recently uh, I attended a focus group discussion uh, on rice, uh, with rice farmers and rice millers. And they mentioned that many rice farmers tend to convert to the more sellable crop like bananas. So they can get more profits by converting their rice farm into a banana plantation. But that does not bode well for us because we are a rice eating people and Earlier, it was mentioned that uh, we're only domestically, we're only able to supply uh, a portion. I, I heard from the discussions that it in the focus group discussion that we're only able to provide 57% of the demand. Uh, right now, it seems that the status is 97% of the demand is being supplied, which means a, hu a huge portion is really from imported rice. And so uh, this is not really a sustainable thing. So if we look to the future, it could lead to potential problems. Uh, arable land formerly used for corn and vegetable far farming have been abandoned due to soil degradation. 
So in the first part, we learned that it's necessary to add fertilizers. And as you very well know, the nutrients in the soil get depleted. So over time, no matter how much fertilizer you put in there, you might not get the harvest that you desire. And so many farmers do not think it's worth investing all the fertilizers, and so they just abandon it. But that leads to more problems because abandoned lands uh, have lost soil cover and are prone to erosion, further reducing land productivity. And soil surface that has become, so those that have been abandoned, they're just lying there, there's not much crop on them, so they will, when it's dry, like drought, you'd have lots of dust. But during rains, so La Nina season, the rainfall does not seep through the soil. They have become semi-permeable, you know, near cement, because the, the soil particles have compacted and prevent the rain from penetrating through. This then leads to further erosion, especially if it's sloping, and it can lead to flooding. So that's the additional threat from climate change. Because um, clim one of the symptoms of climate change are the more intense rainfall. So you can have severe drought and then uh, flash floods when the rains come. And the current cash crops, durian, mangosteen, and other fruit-bearing trees, they are expected to be affected by rainfall patterns. Uh, what's <laughs> the good news is that cacao seems to be a more climate resilient crop because the large amount of leaf litter tends to provide soil conditioning. So I for at least for now, that's the finding that we have found. And some of the recommendations that they have, the group has come up with is to strengthen partnership with the Department of Agriculture uh, in help in the educating the farmers. They found that the farmers do not really know much uh, technically about rainfall and soil quality. They often just rely on what the city agriculturist and what DA tells them. So they just follow the instructions. And that assumes that DA is expertly giving them advice. Uh, sustainable incentives. I think earlier, uh, Secretary Pinol, or Chair Pinol, mentioned that many of the efforts are off target. So the incentives that is provided is not necessarily addressing the problem. Um, they, based on the discussions with the farmers, they think setting a price floor for farm produce would help. Uh, and then I think it was also mentioned that having value added products, not just uh, producing like the raw materials, but other things can probably help. And then uh, determine and replicate best practices and for sustainability, so the organic farming, which is biological farming methods, using vermicast um, would be helpful. For food security, encourage integrated farming methods like permaculture and vertical gardening in every household. Um, maybe as a little environmental science knowledge, uh, the three basic principles of sustainability are really the three, that all energy comes from the sun. So the fossil fuel, we can trace it to the sun. Hydropower, you can trace it to the sun because it's all about temperature. Um, all the biological fuel, the biofuel, they're all about all the energy that's present in them are traceable to the sun. And um, all nutrients in the periodic table, uh, my background is chemistry, all the elements in the periodic table, they have a finite amount. Uh, and you can only cycle them. So it's best to do it naturally, have the worms do the cycling. So, and 
I think you should also consider this because there's a finite amount if they're left in, say, the landfills, for instance, the plastic. So you are losing carbon. <laughs> they're stored in the landfills. They will just be there. So they cannot be used to make new food because in the carbon cycle, you need the carbon source to have for the photosynthesis and all that. And then biodiversity, so, the th so just these three are the principles of sustainability. Keeping them in mind would help. Permaculture, uh, what's good about it is that you are combining crops that protect each other. There's natural protection. Um, Fuzz, a, a priest, a Jesuit priest was trying the permaculture in the retreat house. He said he planted sunflowers together with the petchai. That's why the petchai that he harvested were really huge and they don't have holes because apparently the bees that pollinate the sunflowers tend to protect the petchai. So I think I will just go to the last slide. Um, in conclusion, the new globalization may open economic opportunities for local farmers, but could also pose threats to our environment and to ourselves. We need to find new ways of proceeding, which I think that session three is what it's all about. Thank you. For the information of the participants, this is a local action of the Mindanao Knowledge Center of which three years ago, we formulated uh, Mindanao, we hope that we conduct that for the whole of Mindanao, ground routing, doing suitability assessment of the whole of Mindanao. But uh, because of some constraints related to funding, uh, thank you to Ateneo for leading the initiative and validating the instrument and uh, what I wish for this meeting is that we are supposed to include that in the ways forward and how we could further make the Mindanao higher education institutions mobilize ourselves using this piece of information. Uh, actually, there were about 15 higher education institutions working on this. However, only um, Ateneo volunteered, they used their resources. Uh, of course, that is one of our local actions in, uh, initiated by uh, the Mindanao Development Authority. So thank you for that, Dr. Montecastro. Our next speaker, will talk about uh, harnessing innovations for financial inclusion. Uh, using the Marawi experience. She is known to be Nina, hindi yun la Nina, Nina, by her peers. She is currently the senior manager of Oxfam Pilipinas for programs and partnership. She had seven program portfolios of Oxfam to support poverty reduction and promotion of gender justice and building resilient communities. Nina received several recognition and awards for the program on financial inclusion, which she led, including the Quill Merit Award, Google Impact Challenge Award, Anvil Silver Awards, among others. Nina pioneered the development of Oxfam flagship program also on financial inclusion and digital aid distribution. She is a degree holder of Bachelor of Science in Community Development and finished it as cum laude. With master's degree on women and development from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is a social scientist and development practitioner supporting international adv advocacy on poverty reduction, migrants' rights, children's protection, gender and development, disaster risk reduction, renewable energy and climate change adaptation. Please help me welcome our 
Next speaker, Ms. Maria Teresa. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Let me take you to a different um, phase in discussion where a while ago, um, and Doris um, took us uh, and opened our eyes in terms of using technology, uh, GIS mapping, and how it could um, support agricultural productivity. Now let me take you to a different um, mode and phase of innovation. Uh, where how can we utilize and leverage um, technology for um, increasing um, savings income uh, for economic opportunities of our um, target um, communities. So I was given a task, and thank you for the opportunity for Minda, um, to um, allow us share some of our um, experiences and accomplishments in providing financial inclusion program in the context of uh, Marawi Recovery Program. Um, we would like to focus on how we leverage and harmonize use of financial technology uh, to allow recovery and economic um, um, empowerment of uh, in internally displaced um, populations in Marawi. So just to um, level off, um, before I pursue a discussion on what were the highlights and um, results of um, innovation and financial inclusion in Marawi. Let me level off with our understanding of what is financial inclusion. So financial inclusion is actually a core program of the government led by the Banco Central of the Philippines. And we, uh, through the National Strategy on Financial Inclusion adopted in 2017 by 10 national um, line agencies that support poverty reduction. So financial inclusion according to BSP is a space wherein there is an effective access of a wide range of financial products by all, regardless of economic status. So financial products include savings, credit, insurance, investments, and etc. And to um, further um, understand why this is an important aspect of economic growth, and that would also lead to um, discussion of um, development planning in our um, local communities is that there are a lot still of Filipino that are unbanked. No? To use the uh, term of BSP, unbanked means um, a person who doesn't have any access to formal financial services. So if we use mga informal sources like um, nanghihiram sa kamag-anak o kaya, oo po, may nakaka-relate ba tayo? nag-iimpok sa ilalim, meron pa ba nun? Sa ilalim ng unan, sa PG bank, bank meron pa ba nun? Um, and for others, like, um, it's a sad story in the context of Marawi because they were not able to safe keep no, their um, money and their um, uh, assets in the bank. It was lost no, in their houses along with the uh, fees. So according to the study of BSP, until now, 70% of the Filipino population is unbanked and 70% roughly around 70 million at least, which speaks about the bottom of the pyramid, meaning the mean, uh, uh, base of our population who currently doesn't have access to formal financial services. Uh, this includes um, uh, those that are in formal economies, those that are poor, vulnerable, and in marginalized, uh, geographically isolated communities. While the 30% who has access to financial services, uh, only four revealed that they've used um, accounts, bank accounts, to save money. Still, many of us practice savings at home and keeping our finances on safe uh, inside our home. Um, while many utilizes informal sources of credit for emergency or um, uh, needs of the family, uh, majority are still, you know, borrowing from um, informal sources. Um, a while ago, um, there was a um, topic on um, remittances, and uh, of course, it's linked to our national economy. And up to date, um, the remittances of our OFWs keep our, uh, keeps our uh, economy afloat. Uh, in fact, 
many of our um, uh, many of Filipinos rely on remittances either to um, phone shop uh, or um, money transfer for remittances. And um, sadly to speak, when we speak uh, when we talk about financial services, uh, including insurance, there is really a low penetration of um, uh, insurance coverage, whether we talk of health, education, or asset protection uh, among the Filipinos. So why is this important to discuss and to know all of this information? Because financial inclusion, uh, when it's discussed that it's, there's an effective access of um, uh, financial services to all this wide range of services, we do not only talk about physical access, the banks being available uh, inside the municipio or in rural remote communities, but um, widely speaking, the ability of people to understand and to know what are financial products and how they will benefit from um, the impact of financial services. Financial services should, according to the definition of um, DSP, should promote welfare, uh, of the people so that we'll be able to uh, increase their protection and their um, economic opportunities. It also speaks about developing the right or customized financial products so that there would be increased uh, in utilization of um, such um, services and that financial service providers should maintain um, good um, quality of services so that it will encourage more people to utilize the services. So if we talk about geography, if that is the t uh, statistics and how many still of people are um, considered unbanked, if we talk about um, geographies, uh, in 2017, one of the um, financial technology company um, in the Philippines have actually shared this um, um, study that um, majority still of regions where there are no financial institutions um, are actually uh, unbanked uh, up to date. If you will look at the map, the, greater, um, the gray color represents those that still have no access to formal financial services. Uh, and these are in the northern part of the Philippines, primarily the CAR. Um, in Visayas, Region 8, Eastern Visayas, and in Mindanao, BAR. And if you look at the um, poverty incidences in this area, it's relatively high up to date. Okay. I'd focus on um, ARM. No? When we have implemented, and uh, apologies, it's still ARM at that time because um, when we have concluded the project, you know, uh, the um, ARM was actually um, uh, enacted. So um, when we have um, supported the implementation of financial uh, inclusion for recovery of Marawi, uh, which um, ended, by the way, in December uh, 2018 through the cooperation with um, uh, United uh, Nations um, Development Fund and a number of local partners, uh, we found out still that majority of the people are still unbanked. And why is it important um, for us to discuss financial inclusion? Because financial inclusion is actually an enabler for economic um, development. And if people do not have access to a right financial services, customized according to their needs, to their culture, and their practices, uh, it will not really promote and entice access of people and continuous utilization. Uh, in one of um, several discussions that we had, among the issues that we see, not only um, availability of financial uh, products, but also the cost to go to um, uh, banks or um, districts where financial institutions are available, it's all, the transportation is also very costly and it takes, you know, um, for many half a day or whole day to line up in bank opening an account, but also the geographic isolation increases the vulnerability and lack of interest of people to access financial services. Um, and at the same time, the lack of act or appropriateness of the financial product leads people to be discouraged to use financial products. So um, there were four um, pillars that we have um, discussed where and how financial inclusion would matter in terms of economic growth and opportunity. Primarily targeting those that are um, accessing it, uh, the people or um, coming from the uh, informal economy, um, partners and financial enablers, especially on the financial, uh, financial institutions and technological companies. Of course, working with the Banco Central in terms of having an enabling policy. 
and a platform that would allow all to be connected and all financial services would be able to um, be accessible uh, to all users. So the impact are primarily when we discuss with the communities on how they are affected, they normally um, pay for social services at the same rate of people that, that those are employed or with businesses. Because when they go to banks, they pay for the same transportation. When they open an account, there's no um, um, scheme that if your income is lower, you will have the same amount, minimum maintaining balance, as those, uh, as those that are in business um, sector or the likes. Um, so social services uh, also comes with a greater cost for poor uh, and vulnerable compared to those that are employed in business or in other um, stream of the um, uh, economy. And the financial impact also for local government, if people are not um, able to participate in the formal economy, the cash flow is not retained uh, where they are and thus, um, it does not help in terms of um, boosting local economy because the investment is left um, somewhere else. Okay. Okay. So, um, to focus a bit on the experience in Marawi, what we did was to um, have a proof of concept. If um, digital technologies would enable um, internally displaced population, one, such as Marawi has always been unbanked according to BSP, to utilize financial services, and when we mean financial services, these are digital financial tools that are available in our phones, uh, on app, or using um, uh, SIM-based um, uh, transaction to help 10,000 IDPs immediately access the cash assistance from different um, channels, from government and other international aid to support their recovery and going back, returning back to their municipalities. This program ran for um, um, six to 12 months, supporting um, different cash intervention, primarily access to food, um, cash for work, and cash for care work, because Oxfam also supports um, inclusion of women that are not been able to uh, access um, support. And at the same time, um, providing incentives to local economy or entrepreneurs, micro-entrepreneurs to um, revive their um, lost um, enterprises or livelihood. Okay, so what this program did was to work with financial um, fintech companies uh, and financial sector to um, support and enable um, those that are in formal economy to access different types of services. So this uh, includes connecting uh, traditional banks, um, telco companies, and those that are providing electronic wallets, and even small um, consumer stores, like the mom, yung mga sari-sari store po natin, or mom and pop store, with the idea that people do not have to go to um, uh, municipio and poblacion, but can access their financial um, um, services inside their home, either through the use of their mobile phones, whether these are um, smartphones or the legacy or the candy phones, yung wala pa pong uh, touch screen, no? by only using their SIMs, or if they wanted to go to a store to purchase, they can swipe their card, which is, by the way, personalized, and serve as their identification card, and also make purchases online or through uh, POS. So this program have supported and enabled a lot of fin uh, financial services available in one platform. And the card is actually called IAFORD, which stands for Inclusive and Affordable Financial um, Facilities for Resilient and Developed Filipinos. It's a two-in-one card. It's an identification card. And at the same time, um, it's a prepaid card, which utilizes mobile technology to make transfers, payments, purchases uh, online. And along with this is actually um, harmonizing financial institution to come up with the Sharia compliant um, financial products, understanding that the uh, program is implemented in uh, arm area, especially in Marawi, and also coupled with the development of um, micro halal insurance as a means of social protection for the communities displaced by Marawi siege. And this is um, in cooperation with um, multiple fintech companies and financial um, institutions. Okay, 
And technology is one part of it, just to say. A lot of um, financial literacy awareness program has been done, especially understanding Islamic finance. And we have also done a cooperation with um, uh, Marawi um, uh, Mindanao State University uh, for um, g uh, guidance in terms of how to package the Islamic um, uh, education component. We also leverage on radio programming um, and done radio program and blogs so that people would be able to understand how to use Islamic finance. And at the same time, face-to-face -face education with people for a couple of months. Uh, this includes understanding how to use insurance as a means of social protection, especially those that have lost their houses uh, during the siege. Okay. So, um, because I was told to wrap up as well, <laughs> uh, just in time, <laughs> just in time. Um, so what we have learned in the process of implementing um, the uh, program on using um, innovative tools, financial technologies, as a means of delivering um, assistance, cash assistance to those are affected by um, uh, Marawi siege or of the, uh, the following. One, um, I think um, for our experience as a humanitarian development organization, this is the first that we can say that 100% all those that are targeted to be part of the program receive 100% their assistance. Despite that they went back to different location and um, you could imagine the horror of our partners when IDPs are moving in different areas, different regions because they are looking for uh, employment and uh, economic opportunities. But the uh, beauty of the technology is that when they are already registered and they have their card uh, activated, the cash disbursement can flow real time wherever they are. 100% um, of them have received their cash assistance during the entire program, along with their um, uh, micro halal uh, insurance. And some of them have also um, moved um, a step further for continuing their um, insurance, especially those that are covered um, um, for housing um, uh, protection. Um, at the same time, we have significantly seen an increase of utilization of um, financial transaction with a Sari Sari store that was enabled to become a money in, money out and a, uh, agent. Based on the data analytics that we have for the program, there are around um, 200 unique um, transactions on a monthly basis on these enabled stores. And this um, expands from those that are not given the card, but those community members that uh, were allowed to do remittances, deposit, or purchases. Okay. Um, another part of the findings of the uh, uh, project is that there was also an increase in terms of um, understanding Islamic finance and how they can actually operate it on their day-to-day -day, um, activities. Also understanding what is data rights. Nowadays, when we move to digital technology, alongside should um, have the awareness program on data privacy, data protection, and people understanding their data rights. And um, according to our post-distribution uh, monitoring study, when we conducted it, from those that are very low to none understanding of um, these um, themes, there were an increase up to 40% um, depending on where they are. Those that are more into social media have higher chances of accessing the information, but those, those that are living in um, far-flung communities were able to access through um, pamphlets or um, yung PA system po na umiikot no, within, the, uh, within the barangays and communities. Um, surprisingly, there was also a high increase of um, collaboration and cooperation uh, on this program, and this avoids um, duplication, uh, especially with UN agencies. When you top and leverage on a platform that would allow disbursement of assistance and services to community, there is a greater um, um, chance of having a greater impact. And it was proven that it can be scalable and can be managed by different institutions. Um, regardless if there are um, um, techno savvy or uh, not. Um, another is um, also the support of civil society uh, to become an enabler, especially of the local government of financial inclusion and the development of um, Islamic um, finance program in their um, community. And lastly, 
there was a clamor, not only a uh, part of the study, but also a clamor from um, internally displaced population to increase investment in the use of Islamic finance and if local governments would be able to integrate this in their development programming as a uh, backbone of halal enterprises or livelihood. With that, maraming salamat po. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that, Ma'am Nina. We just heard an evidence of an organization mobilizing local stakeholders and capitalizing local resources to spur local economy. A good model worth replicated in the whole of Mindanao. Our third speaker. We'll talk about the BMP Yaga International Cooperation, a window for opportunity of the ASEAN single production base. He is currently serving as the Deputy Executive Director and concurrent head of the Investment Promotions, International Relations and Public Affairs of the Mindanao Development Authority. He also performs as the official Minda spok spokesperson and liaison to Congress and the Office of the President. So dito tayo, liaison ng Office of the President. <laughs> With his knowledge and expertise, he sought out the resource person for many talks on various issues about Mindanao. For nearly 20 years in government, his career has spanned across five administrations starting from the Ramos to the third to the 30 administration and has illustrated a feat of rising from the ranks in the various key executive offices under the office of the president ladies and gentlemen please help me welcome Asik Romeo M Montenegro Ayan, salamat, uh, Doc Campaner. Uh, my boss at my other boss because my other boss is uh, si Doc Rec, there. Um, at one point, uh, many months ago, uh, I also had the opportunity to teach at University of Southeastern Philippines um, Mintal Campus, the college of, uh, or the, the graduate school. Uh, unfortunately, with the difficulty of time because it happens every Saturday, and I am on travel most of the time of the week. So I only have Sundays for my family. So nagalit yung wife ko. Uh, and therefore, uh, superior in any family setup is the decision of the wife. But I always have the last say. And that is yes, dear. So may hapon, kanatong tanan, this afternoon I'll be walking you through, although many of you, many times in the past, have encountered discussions, perhaps even frustrating ones about BAMP Iaga. And what is it all about? How has Mindanao and Palawan, being the focus areas of this cooperation, been able to take advantage? And where is it now, 25 years at, after it was formed in Davao City, with by no less than uh, President Ramos, and then um, Prime Minister Mahathir, and along with Sultan Bulkiya and uh, former president of Suharto of Indonesia. The discussion this afternoon is understanding how BIMPEA AGA can become or has been uh, positioning itself as a production base for ASEAN's sub-regional um, network. But as uh, history had pointed it out um, and as, had, uh, as I had cited earlier, uh, it began as a major um, um, policy uh, push of then President um, Ramos, who thought that creating such a sub-regional cooperation will provide an accord opportunity for Mindanao to make an international cooperation or do international cross-border linkaging. Because otherwise, everything is way up to national capital to deal with such international relations. 
uh, lahat na sa Manila nakatutok, nakafocus. Wala tayong opportunity in Mindanao to have actual economic interchange or trade policy discussions with our neighbors within the four countries. And so, Bimpiaga came into being with that uh, particular agenda in mind. So Bimpiaga does not involve the entire four countries, but only identified focus areas. In the case of the Philippines, it's Mindanao and Palawan. In case of Malaysia, it's the states of Sabah, Labuan, and Sarawak. In Indonesia, the provinces, East-West Kalimantan, North Sulawesi, South Sulawesi, Maluku. What you see are neighboring areas within the four countries. Now, here's the catch. Even before ASEAN was formed way back in 1967, uh, even before economic integration and globalization was brought into public discourse by formal governments, Centuries ago, socio-cultural and economic integration is already happening in these areas. Kaya nga may barter trading. Kaya nga kung had Magellan not stumbled upon a landmass called later on as Las Islas Filipinas, chances are today we are either Bruneians, Malaysians, or Indonesians. At least tayo nandito sa Mindanao and Palawan. Because many, many centuries ago, we were part of that one big sultanate. Kaya nga tayo may claim sa Saba eh, um, because of that particular reality. Yun nga lang, it altered the course of our destiny because of the 300 years of subjugation by the Spanish um, colonizers. So, naging iba ang ating direction. But without that particular instance, then probably... We're sharing the same thing already with our neighbors. So we're just going back to history in terms of BAMP Iaga. This is not a new concept. This is something that is revisiting our ways of life in the past. Now, BIMP Iaga also um, is just one among the many other sub-regional cooperations that were established back in the early 90s as recommended by the ASEAN Development Bank. The Asian Development Bank put forward notions at that time that for certain economies and territories to move forward at an accelerated phase, they have to be grouped together. They have to find commonalities as a regional bloc, as a sub-regional bloc. Kaya nga tayo may alliances, growth triangles, because we can share, complement our resources, we have commonalities, and therefore we can leverage to bigger markets. That's the design of the sub-regional cooperation. Now, among all of these major sub-regions, Bimpiaga is among the most dynamic. The other one that is also close to us is the Indonesia-Malaysia-Thailand. So the border areas of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand is part of that IMTGT. Another big grouping is the Greater Mekong sub-region, or GMS, which, which involves countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Thailand. Yun nga lang, GMS involves the entire countries not just focus areas. Now, in terms of scales of economies, itong GMS alone, as a growth triangle, supplies 44% of the world's rice requirement. Diyan tayo nag import ng ating NFA rice, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam under the GMS Mekong. Bakit? They have a natural irrigation, which is the Mekong River. Kaya nga, Saganang-sagana sila sa tubig, wala silang problema, and therefore, they had been through the years, although, with the minds of Filipino experts in Erie, been able to transfer to them, and then the irony is, we trained them on rice production, and now we are buying rice from these countries. Now, IMTGT is also a major source of agricultural products such as rubber. One of the world's largest rubber producer is that area. BIMP Iaga, meanwhile, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia, is the world's major source of palm oil. With 5 to 6 million hectares planted to palm oil alone, it is shipped to around 130 countries all over the world, thereby a major source of revenue for Indonesia and Malaysia in terms of agri-exports. Pagdating naman ka Pilipinas, we just dislodge 
other South American countries and we regained our leadership from Ecuador in terms of our banana exports. We are second, we used to be second, now we are first in terms of exports of our Cavendish bananas. In terms of exports of canned pineapples, Philippines is fourth in the world. And these two commodities, pineapples and banana, are from Mindanao. It's our strength. It's within BAMP Iaga area. So that's how BAMP Iaga thinks of its economy. What can we leverage together so that we can penetrate bigger markets? Aside from trading across our own borders. So this is no different from the bigger concepts of globalization, starting with WTO, then you have the 20 countries plus the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, uh, the discussions of um, tariff, uh, free trade under ASEAN, and then the smaller scale, which involves Mindanao and Palawan for the Philippines, and our neighboring provinces in Malaysia and Indonesia, and the entire state of Brunei Darussalam, because it's very small. Brunei Darussalam only has a population of over 400,000, and it's a country, and therefore it's part of the BAMP Iyaga. Now, the focus of this sub-regional cooperation, balikan na natin yung slide na yun, is looking at finding complementation in terms of our outlook for development, growth, and planning, for instance. So that when we do planning in Mindanao via our Mindanao 2020, uh, which includes Palawan in the context of BMP Iaga, we look at where we are in the bigger context of BIMP Iaga. Not known to many, Ang daming nagtatanong, ano bang nagawa ng BAMP Iaga over the course of 25 years since it's existed? Um, probably, uh, we are partly to blame. We have not been able to communicate well because we'd rather want it to be behind the scenes lang. But many of the infrastructure, big ticket infrastructure tickets in Mindanao or projects in Mindanao and Palawan were approved because of BAMP Iaga as a major justification. Davao International Airport, when it was approved way back in 2000, is only as small as Lagindingan. Two bridge airport lang siya. Ngayon, four bridges siya, di ba, ang Davao? But when it was approved, ganun kaliit lang. We argued then that Davao is supposed to be the gateway to ASEAN and Bimpiaga. It deserves a much bigger airport. So, nireview balik ng NEDA sa DOTR and then eventually na-approve ang malaking airport for Davao. Kahit nga ngayon, kinukulang na siya because that was built to accommodate 3 million passengers. Dabao International Airport is already receiving over 4 million passengers on the average. Another case in point, you've heard about the Mindanao Railway. The first phase is Tagum Dabao Digos. What was proposed to the national government is two truck electric powered. But what was approved is one truck diesel powered. Many other projects we proposed way up there did not get to national approval because of the lack of financial IRR or internal rate of return, lack of viability. We argued that Mindanao should be seen in a different lens when it comes to projects. Hindi naman ito private projects that are expected to earn revenues. These are public goods funded by public and taxpayers' money. Loan nga lang. And therefore, what is to be used as lens is the economic IRR, the economic internal rate of return, not the FIRR. So this has been the advocacy of MINDA, and we factored in BIMP Iaga to scale up that viability. Case in point, three bridge projects we proposed in Tawi-Tawi were deferred by NEDA ICC for lack of viability. So we provided further justification that Tawi-Tawi is being positioned to, to be having an economic zone, a free port zone, because that Siboto Strait is being traversed by around 13,000 ships, international ships, every year. We are not getting any Sintabo because we do not have facility. And so when they realized that in approved yung three bridge projects to connect the entire Tawi Tawi, because Tawi Tawi is spread with several island municipalities. The biggest landmass is Bongao, pero pag tawid mo lang si Tangkay, waters na yan. Yung dulo pa, yung Sibuto, which is a bigger landmass also, ang layo na. So therefore, this has to be integrated by physical means through bridges. And eventually, NEDA approved, NEDA ICC and NEDA board approved the three bridges. Many other similar projects in Mindanao are currently pending at the national level for the reason that it lacks financial viability. Kaya nga, part of the advocacy work of MINDA is to 
move towards having national government approve the priorities identified in Mindanao. Case in point, you have your General Santos International Airport. Ilang flights ba? Yet, when it was designed and funded by the Americans, it took note of BAMP Iaga and ASEAN as a future um, possibility of that airport serving such an economies of scale later on. So when we do planning, we put the context now of ASEAN in our effort. Now for every project you put up in Mindanao, if you're looking at exporting later on, then you have an immediate market across BAMP Iaga of around 50 million rather than just focusing on 22 million Mindanaoans or northward towards Visayas and Luzon. Because in here, we're already enjoying the same tariff of zero across over 10,000 tariff lines in ASEAN. Plus, the extra facilitation of BAMP IAGA specific policies. So that if you travel from Jensan to Manila, because you wanted to go to any of the three other countries in the BIMP IAGA, you don't have to pay the 1,600 travel tax because there is a policy called BIMP IAGA travel tax exemption accorded only to the Mindanaoans and the Palawans wanting to travel in any of the four or any of the three other countries in BAMP IAGA. Now, through the years, because of what has BIMP IAGA been able to work out, ASEAN has gradually saw its importance in terms of piloting many protocols within ASEAN level. Your GSM phones, GSM pa yan noon, bago naging 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G na ngayon, and later on 6G, the protocol for GSM was pilot tested in the BAMP Iaga area, where you have discount rates when you call across the border. The fifth freedom traffic light, uh, rights of, of the air linkages started with the BAMP Iaga also before it became an ASEAN protocol. The latest was the non convention size ships, yung Jong Kong, Kompit, Lancha, less than five tonnage na wooden hull, yung mga kahoy lang na bangka, na supposedly by virtue of International Maritime Organization standards, as of January 1st of 2017, should have been transitioned into steel vessels na. You're no longer allowed to traverse international waters carrying cargo using wooden vessels because you need to be upgrading to steel vessels. Can we expect that from our people of Tawi-Tawi, the barter traders of Basilan Sulu, to transition to steel vessels, or the people of Salangani dealing trade with across the border in Indonesia, having to transition to steel vessels? Definitely not. That's why under BIMP Iaga, the four countries agreed, for now, let us agree that wooden hull will remain to be a mode of transport because many countries in Europe up until today still use that. And also, it is illogical for just a two-hour distance to be using steel vessel for such a very small scale of cargo. That's why wooden vessel is allowed under a non-convention size um, protocol. Last year, ASEAN made that as a 10-country policy to adopt. That in, in the, the MOU on NCSS, it started at the BAMP Iaga. So this is what we're saying that BIMP Iaga provides the test case in pilot testing many of the ASEAN protocols. The newest one now is the MRA on professions. Of course, we've all heard, having come from the academe, that there were seven professions. The last one was the tourism professions to be harmonized in terms of standards across 10 countries. So that standards here and standards here will become one, the same. And so that if I am an engineer, um, a geotech engineer, an accountant, a nurse here in the Philippines, I can practice to any other nine countries in ASEAN without having to go through another certification because our certification standard is already accepted as theirs. And vice versa, we can also entice professions from other ASEAN countries to practice in us without going through another layer of certification. That is under ASEAN MRA. We are looking at piloting that under BAMP Iaga because at ASEAN level, nahihirapan pa sila ngayon to pursue it at, at, as a 10-country regional um, protocol. So moving further, BIMP Iaga, anything we do uh, to make things happen, fall within connectivity so that we have direct flights and shipping routes, food basket because of our strength in the sub-region as a major food basket of the world, Tourism because many of the UNESCO heritage sites are located within BIMP Iaga. Environment because the richest biodiversity of the world happened to be 
within the BAMP Iyaga. Particularly, advance lang ng Sulusi, paglampas mo, parts of Brunei. That's why it's called Coral Triangle because the richest biodiversity in that area is located. And sociocultural because of the commonalities we share across the four regions or four countries. So through the years, we went through ups and downs also. Uh, ito yung tanong, anong nangyari? Well, we had our glory days back in 1997. I can recall at that time, at the height of Bimpiaga, nakafocus ang lahat sa Jensan. Kaya booming Jensan ang tagline at that time. Many other projects rise. Marco Polo rose. Uh, several other projects were firmed up. Kaya lang we got all watered down by the Asian, the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Plus, nagka-all-out war in 2000 under Estrada administration. And then eventually, we got the revival of Bimpiaga at the assumption of the GMA administration. And through the years, uh, there were roadmaps put together. And the last one, the latest one, is the Bimpiaga Vision 2025, which is aligning what we should be doing in Mindanao to what is actually happening in ASEAN. Kaya nga, yung ating road, from Jensen all the way to Dabao, all the way to Lu Visayas and Luzon to Baguio is called ASEAN Highway because that is a virtual highway connecting all of us as Philippines as a country to our neighbors in ASEAN. Fortunately, under this president who is from Mindanao, we're now seeing more efforts towards strengthening further our engagement under BAMP Iaga. And the first Three state visits done by the president upon assumption into office way back in 2016 were visits to Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei just to signify his strong interest and commitment to support these centuries-old brotherly ties. And so because of BIMP Iaga, uh, we are geared up towards re-establishing, reviving lost um, trucks, lost connections that we have had in the past, this time around with many um, revival policies, particularly in terms of sea links, connectivity, and starting this with um, ensuring that our growth corridor um, concept is also aligned with the corridor concept in other countries. Case in point, when Palawan planned the development of Bululuyan port at the tip of Palawan, Malaysia also, in parallel, moved towards funding the development of Kudat in the port, port of Kudat in Malaysia to give way later on to a direct shipping route between Palawan and Kudat. Dabo Airport is about to be upgraded uh, under a PPP arrangement. And so when Indonesia learned of it, Samratulangi in um, North Sulawesi, Manado, which is just one hour away from General Santos, or less than an hour away from General Santos, is also upgrading their airports in tandem with what Dabao is doing. This is the kind of planning we wanted Mindanao to pursue, looking at benchmarking ourselves as to what our neighbors are also doing, so that collectively we can package ourselves as one market and we can have later on a single production base for our complementation of products. And so because of the Vimpiaga Vision 2025, around $21 billion worth of projects were identified, making Vimpiaga among the most dynamic sub-regions in ASEAN in terms of the cost of projects. $21 billion, half of that accounts for projects in Mindanao and Palawan, particularly in airports development, railways, power, ICT, airports, inland transport services that we now tag as a BAMP project. So pag later on, i-develop na ang Dabao Airport or road projects or port development of Makar, itatag yan as BAMP project because it will be reportable ng Philippine government to BIMP Iaga. In the same manner as other countries in the BIMP Iaga report the progress of the Borneo, Pan Borneo Highway and many other projects as you will see later on in uh, the slides. So Bimpiaga as an economy accounts for one-fifth of the total GDP of ASEAN. Ganun kalaki ang economy ng BAMP Iaga. 
moving further in terms of connectivity, this is where we would want um, to put focus on in terms of getting national government see the viability of these priority projects we've identified in Mindanao. Because this is how also other neighbors are progressing. 20 years ago, in my first trip to Kota Kinabalu, para lang siyang Kota Bato City. Today, when you go to Kota Kinabalu, para na siyang Cebu. With huge infrastructure, um, a transformed area, ang bilis ng progress ni Kota Kinabalu na pag-iwanan tayo dito sa Mindanao. Because that's how their national governments are looking at in terms of the viability of focus areas of BIMP Iaga. And so in terms of progress of major projects, we track it as an entire sub-region. So we're looking at what's the progress so far of that road connecting Bitong and Manado. Yung expansion nila from two lanes to four lanes. Because that will be important and critical later on once we will have our trading actively being pursued between North Sulawesi and Dabao and General Santos, for instance. So airports, seaports, and air connectivity. And new routes that had been um, opened up. And fortunately, Garuda announced that it will start serving the Dabao Manado direct flights starting September 27. Reviving what has been in existence many years ago in terms of direct connectivity between Davao and Manado. This is what we want to have for a long time to complement the shipping link we have today. Kasi if you are going to Manado now, you have to fly Jensan to Manila, Manila to Jakarta, Jakarta to Manado, 20 hours travel time. But if a direct flight is available, that's just one hour and five minutes at a fraction of a cost. Ganon din sa ating shipping link between Mindanao and North Sulawesi. We have many products being shipped in this area, or we are buying products from this area, go all the way. Let's say Republic Chemicals, Roof Sealant, Motolite Batteries, and many other things, including our sardines in Bitong many years ago, have to go to Manila before reaching Dabao. Many other products from Manila go to Jakarta, Jakarta to Surabaya, Surabaya to North Sulawesi, that's about three weeks. Whereas, Dabao, Jensen, Bitong is only a day and a half. So you see, this is the logic why in Mindanao, we wanted to establish these links because this is not something that people in Manila understand or see the viability of. Ang tingin nila sa atin, crazy, because wala daw market ito. But the reality is, our neighbors are the one taking advantage. That, that's why because of ASEAN, everything, almost everything we enjoy today are products of ASEAN. This morning, anong kinain niyo pang umaga? Probably nag-fried egg, fried meat or fried fish, fried chicken, fried baya, eh, palm oil, which is imported from Indonesia or Malaysia. In the grocery sales of the supermarkets today, you will see 80% of the cooking oil available in that particular shelf. Kahit sa ang market, Robinson's, SM, palm oil na. Then you drink Copico. Kopiko is an Indonesian coffee. Candy lang yan noon, dito coffee. It dislodged Nestle as the number one three-in-one coffee in the Philippine market. Ngayon, nawala na si Sanmig, nawala si Nestle, natabunan ni Kopiko. And Kopiko just launched a 3 billion processing plant in Batangas. They were looking at having it in Dabao or in Mindanao. Wala silang nakitang lugar when they scouted um, the place about a year ago. So they, they tried to put it up in Batangas Anyway, pa para centro sa distribution all over the Philippines. Imports of coffee, 20% of the world's cacao production is also coming from Indonesia across our border. So these are things where Mindanao stand the chance to be able to improve our standing if you looked at how our neighbors are also performing. Huwag na nating isipin anong policy ang nilalabas ng national government because most of the times, those national templates do not reflect the realities on the ground. Kaya nga, si Secretary Pinyol has a lot to say on that particular context. So moving, moving on further, food, food basket, as I pointed out earlier, where Bimpiaga areas provide and supports or supplies most of uh, the food products, including fisheries. Um, in many countries. 
and therefore has to look at consolidating and, um, and, and complementing. Many years ago, uh, ang daming nag-comment, what do we trade across borders? We generally provide and produce the same thing. We're not looking at trading, same thing. We're looking at complementation. For instance, Mindanao is the only country, or Philippines is the only country in ASEAN that is avian flu-free, except for the ASF na umataki na sa um, Rizal many days ago. But in terms of avian flu-free, Philippines, therefore viable si Mindanao to produce massive poultry production fed with bumper harvest corn ng Gorontalo na nagko-complement yung harvest time nila sa lean season naman natin sa Pilipinas. And then certified halal by Brunei and Malaysia and then off we go to bigger markets of the Middle East. That is the kind of sub-regional complementation or the regional production network being established in ASEAN. Kaya nga ngayon, sumasakay ka sa iyong Rebo, or hindi na Rebo, sumasakay ka sa iyong Innova, Toyota, which is a Japanese brand, but is being assembled, some parts manufactured in Indonesia, rubber is from Thailand, many other electronics are several in several other countries. That's because of the ASEAN production network. Ganun din ang gusto nating mangyayari in terms of our strength. Now, in the case of Mindanao, we don't want to compete with Calabarzon in producing semiconductors and electronic products. That is not our strength. Our strength is in the agri-sector, where 40% of the country's food trade come from, where 60% of jobs created in Mindanao are related to the agriculture value chain. And therefore, if we wanted to create a dent in terms of reducing poverty, where it is prevalent in rural areas, what sector do we go? Agriculture to be able to create more jobs and improve our value chain and productivity. And this is what we would want to leverage under BAMP IAGA. Mindanao is very much well positioned to be able to take advantage of this. We just want to make sure that the national government sees the logic of this effort by providing us the necessary support in terms of infrastructure. Because up until today, we're only getting 12% of the national budget the OTR budget alone, 90% is in Luzon, only 3% is allocated to Mindanao. At least DPWH, 40% of public works budget annually is already allocated to Mindanao. But many other agencies have yet to see the light of looking at the benefit, the impact of prioritizing projects in Mindanao. And in so doing, we would be able to strengthen Mindanao's positioning towards making sure that we are able to actively engage and be a major player as we are already are in terms of our country's export production. Six out of exportable commodities of the Philippines come from Mindanao. And therefore, if we harness our strength, complemented with the strength of our neighbors in the BAMP IAGA, then there is so much that we can penetrate in terms of market and scaling up of our production. And so that for every improved production, in a particular commodity in Mindanao, an expansion of the extra, of the special agroeconomic zone in impoverished areas in Mindanao, supported with farm to market roads to connect production areas to the highways, to the market centers, to the processing centers, and to the ports. Then we scale up the productivity of Mindanao, very different from what we have today, which is a fragmented farming setup, small scale. And so, what we wanted to accomplish in this effort is to create a mindset through the students, through the general public, the traders, the government workers in Mindanao to embrace the reality that today there is so much potential that Mindanao can take advantage of if we are on the same page, the same paragraph, the same sentence, and the same period in terms of the vision of growth for Mindanao in the larger context of ASEAN. And we can achieve that through BAMP IAGA in with support of our development partners. And this is how we would want Mindanao, a major player in terms of our um, being able to provide the necessary inputs for a sub-regional production base. Magandang salamat, terima kasih, magandang hapon po. Maraming salamat, uh, Asik Montenegro for that uh, presentation about how Mindanao has that vantage point to, to work with other countries in relation to economy.
Our fourth speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, an architect by profession and finished her bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of the Philippines in Mindanao, where she was granted this thesis award and the Reed Point National Thesis Award from the, uh, for the undergraduate architecture thesis in the Philippines. She also finished their, her master's degree in urban and cultural heritage in Australia. In 2013, she launched the Suito Designs Incorporated, a studio based in Davao City, focusing on urban and cultural heritage design. Few of her works are the, Bago, the cultural village for Bagobo tribe in Kapatagan and the design of, redesign of the Tibul, uh, Pano, Panoluanan cultural village of Atapakibato tribe. Apart from being an architect, she is also the founder of various social enterprises such as Balai 3D Architecture, a toy making company focusing on Mindanao and Filipino architecture. She has worked in several heritage architecture fields while studying her masters, especially in the adaptive reuse of heritage railway stations in Victoria, the stone restoration drawings for RMIT Romanist buildings in Melbourne, and the design proposal for the rehabilitation of Sercom Taiho Lake Heritage China, a government competition where her team garnered the finalist um, honor. She is currently one of the principal architects of Suito Designs and was recently assigned as Chief Operating Officer of the Suito Social Innovation Hub Co-working co and Maker Spaces. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome architect Glory Rose D. Metellia. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for that wonderful introduction, sir. Uh, let me start by sharing to you my experience when I first, uh, w when it was my first time to be here in Mindanao. I was just 10 years old when my father, who was a Mindanaoan, brought me and my twin sister in this place called Misamis Oriental. And when you say Misamis Oriental, it is a significant place due to its numerous Heritage sites such as the Hasaan Church, the old house in Balingwan with the, the, the human uh, uh, structure, and even the house of the late Vice President Pelaez at Medina Misamis Oriental. So when I went to the place, I had a very unique feeling. I experienced what scientists called prison. Prison is when you encounter something so beautiful that inspiring that it cuts deep to your core and your hair at the back stands up. Okay? And for some of you, it might be a different type of prison. You, it can be food, the music that was just played this morning, you feel a little bit, you know, had a very strong feeling about it. But for me, it was the entire built environment, or the architecture of the place. And perhaps it is this reason why I took architecture in college and urban and cultural heritage in my master's. Now, I want to emphasize the importance of architecture in the way we live. It is so that instead of putting buildings in the background of our experiences, let's put buildings out in the forefront. Architecture provides, it, it's because architecture is everywhere, and when it's everywhere, it influences us. You know. It is providing us the continuity with the past and connects us together. So, 
Let me invite you to think of a place in the past or in present that you so love. And then ask yourself that question. Why are we connected to that place? The answer to that is very obvious. It is because we have memories of the place. The memories, both happy and sad, make up the value and significance of the place. Now, attaching value to a place via your memory is universal. It happens all the time. For example, in the family level, we value our homes so much that we even have our favorite spots. For me, I really love our main door. It's because in the main door, I can see my height progression. <laughs> when I was still eight, I used to be very taller than my twin sister. And when I was 10, she used to be taller than me by a half inch. Well, wow, right. And at the local level, we value places through Mary by making them historical landmarks, correct? And place of tourist spots. And in the national level, we make things and places our national treasures, like our Torogan, to show value. In fact, we even do this globally by putting places with historical value and aesthetic value in the World Heritage Site list. And because of the WHS, places like the Great Wall of China and Taj Mahal have become a universal value. Assigning values of places carry memories across time. Our significant stories are given places to reside and allow a continuing dialogue from generation to generation. Okay. Yeah. This holds true in one of our research projects called the Mindanao Domestic Architecture Style Guide. We started documenting 11 Mindanaoan or indigenous uh, culture communities, structures, in Davao, and, and tried to preserve and promote these styles. But we needed to give it a, some of the research background through an architecture analysis. First of all, let me tell you that this endeavor is not just mine. We, there are about 50 volunteers in Davao and continuing to, to grow. And it's still in a work in progress. Let, to start, let me give you a context of Mindanao vernacular architecture in the Philippines. What do we know about it? We know very little about it, right? In fact, during my architecture college days, it was never, never mentioned. There was a whole section of Japanese, Chinese, and Western architecture in the entire architecture course, but no course on Mindanao architecture. Yes, there was Filipino architecture, but it was just for a week. Don't get me wrong, there are little discourses on Filipino architecture, especially the colonial architecture, which our very good friend, archi architect Jared Rico, has so lovingly researched through his book. However, most of the architect's research when it comes to heritage in the Philippines was focused on the Spanish and the American influences in the Philippines. There were obviously little focus on domestic Mindanaoan architecture. The irony about this is that our pre-Spanish heritage dates back very, very long now, 3,000 years ago, and it still exists until today. This is preserved through the traditions of indigenous brothers and sisters by passing memory and remembering and passing and remembering to generations and generations. Okay. Now, una ako slide. According to the United Nations Development Program, there are about, I just learned, na, na, na 180, and 30% and of this is in Luzon, na culture communities, and 60, 69 of this is in Mindanao. 67 of these IP cultural communities are in the mountain ranges, you know. So this paper will focus, okay, wait. Based on our architectural research through the process of participatory design and remembering a place, there are five types of Mindanao architecture, or Mindanao structures. These are the livelihood building, the domestic building, the justice building, 
and the prayer building and the educational building. So we just know the domestic buildings. So because we know this a little, let's talk about it. So this paper will focus on domestic building. Okay. In Davao alone, there are 11 cultural communities, which are Tausog, Maguindanawan, Iranon, Kagan, Maranao, Matigsalog, Atapakibato, Bagoboklata, Bagogo Talgabawa, Sama, and Ovo Manobo. For the purposes of this presentation, I am go going to talk to you about the domestic structures of just five. Kasi basin maanta sa uban. So, okay. Let's first talk about first cultural community. Domestic architecture is from the Ata cultural community, which is called Binanwa. It is the vernacular term of the Ata's traditional house. Inside is where you can find five uh, find benches with six main posts and nine other posts. There are place there are place for sleeping and you know seating. And, the, and these benches are at the edge of the walls because it is a windowless structure, no windows. This is so that it can provide light for the place and also they can see the scenery. And the house is usually oriented at the Sidlakan or the eastern part so they can see the sunrise. The most interesting part of this construction of the house of the Atta, which is the Binanwa, is its rituals called Padugusamanok or Panubat. It is to ask permission from the Magbayo and Manama to use the land for building their house. This can be done by dropping blood of chicken on site and an ample amount of blood is sprinkled in the mamuan, which is that, that uh, plate. And then a pair is then done and it is burnt. And then to know if the construction of the house will go on smoothly, the head of the chicken used in the padugo sa manok should be facing the sunrise in its last breath. So when we had a ritual, unfortunately, the head of the chicken was facing at, not on the Sidlakan. So, oh my gosh, <laughs> it has to be changed in the next day? No. They just have to um, burn more and more just to throw away the, the bad luck. So, okay. Next. Okay. What is also most interesting in the Binanua construction is the Kogon roof, which is unique weave selapid in the frames of the roof. This is very unique because you cannot find it anywhere. Selapid. So, it is also to signify the data strength and achievement. Okay. The second domestic structure which you will realize that is very different from the Binanwa is the house of the Bagoboklata, which is called Baloy. It is a single family dwelling unit made from light material source surround in surrounding areas. The whole, whole house stands on stilts, forming an underfloor space called palong, which is used to shelter livestock or extra storage. One enters the baloy through a covered porch, management porch, which serves as a gathering, so now she porch. And then the other areas is used for resting and kitchen. A baloy, like the Binanwa, also has a ritual to know if it's a good site. And that it is a task of the elders to do that. When a, choice, when a site has been chosen, foundation stones are laid bearing on mind that the house must face where? At the sunrise again. So and then there is a panubad tubad by the elders and, and a prayer. And it must be done, that this must be done so that the house might gain strength together with the occupants. The act is then followed by letting the blood of the sacrificial fowl on the site, which is then cooked and consumed afterwards. Okay. The third domestic structure of our cultural community is uh, of the Obo Manovo House, which you will also realize that it's quite different from the other two, is called the Baoy. It's the Obo Manovo's house. It is rectangular in plan, it's not square. So. It is used for a single family dwelling. And it's usually elevated 1.5 meters above the floor for protection of dampness and penetration. So some of the uh, domestic houses like the Atta is very elevated up high because it's a tree house. Some are very, very low. In olden times, the houses are elevated from the ground six feet, so higher. 
And the flooring of the house is commonly made of bamboo slots spaced in between, which allows air circulation. That's why it's cooler. The space on the floor is called a sulip, which is utilized for storage or bed. Okay. The house is commonly made of materials thriving around the site again, and um, like bamboo, round timber, kogon, nipa, and sun-dried kogon. What is very interesting in the Booy is that it has a very the intricate window style. And aside from that, compared to the other ones, what happened? Okay. It has a separate structure. No? It has a separate structure called the Sagpo. The two others will have separate separate structure. This is for the provision for storing the rice. So rice, farmers, I think I know. On the site selection naman, um, and construction process, they have mo more intricate superstition beliefs. So on one, one will determine if the site is good or desirable for construction through dreams or revelations, particularly in based on the batok or based on the color of the dream. For, so for example, if the color of the dream is white, so the next day you are allowed to construct. If the color of the dream is red or black, so it is not good for construction. Another old example of this also is the carabao. So if they select a site, they put a carabao there. And if, the carab uh, if a carabao is placed inside in the middle of the chosen site, if the carabao appeared to be restless and stood throughout the night, then it is clear indication that the site is bad for construction. Okay. The fourth domestic structure, which is my favorite, <laughs> personal favorite, is the ballet of the, mat, uh, of the Matigsalog people. So it is a family shelter and still about 0.6 meters high. So this is not a tree house, guys. One enters a ballet through a ladder and into a single open interior floor plan. So as compared to the other ones, this ballet has no porch. So it's literally going to the private space directly and not to the public private space. Ju hanging just above the interior space is the abuhan, and so it can also serve as a kitchen and a sleeping space all around. So for the ritual, before the construction of the belay, a good site must be selected. A single piece of wood is placed, somewhat alawaan, placed upright and rooted to the ground. So if that wood, so so not good for construction to the next day. If in the well and good, just construct. Also, it is important to locate the sunrise of the house. Also the sunrise, because that's where the house is oriented. And a ritual of the Babylon is also done, which is also somewhat the same with the Padogo Samano. Okay, the last culture community uh, among the five that I'm going to discuss is the uh, commu culture community house of the Bogobo Tagabawa, which is called Bale. The bale is considered the basic residential unit with a size just enough to shelter one family. So most of these are one family dwelling uh, vernacular architectures. The whole structure is supported above the ground with timber poles and is usually uh, um, distributed near Sweden patches. Inside, one is immediately uh, immediate on the sunad, which is the household sala, derecho pa sa sala. After the sala is the dalam, which is a sleeping area where personal belongings are found. There is also a little bit of an andana, which is a little attic inside. O okay, although leaping up plants, gentle slopes, they prefer gentle slopes, uh, even if they are living up plants. So the house building should be a little you know, flatter because it believed to bring misfortune. When a site is desired, a pair and a song is offered, then a ritualist or the linahan performs a rashon, a ritual which involves sacrificial chicken chosen and dripped in a small dog hole. This is done so that the belief of the bad luck is going to the dog hole and not to the occupants. Does this resonate, this, this type of you know, rituals that we do? Okay, let me just give you a, a brief Look at the other uh, other houses of the Moro Moro Moro, Moro culture community of uh, Davao. So that's the Astana Tausog, which is which is seen, uh, no, in other places as well in the Mindanao. 
And this one is the, uh, the Walay of Maguindanao, domestic structure. The Iranon Storogan, which is nice, you know, very interesting. And of course, the very famous Maranao Torogan. So, I said favorite na ko ang ganina, mas favorite na ko ni. <laughs> so, this is uh, Maranao Torogan. And also the Sama House, um, which is called Luma. And the Kagan Sugan, which is a very intricately done bamboo house. Now, after we have documented the houses, we did an architectural analysis process to compare and contrast the significant values aesthetically of the houses. And to summarize all of this, all of these houses have rituals involved before construction. I'm talking about the uh, cultural community of the I priests. Okay. Um, it is because in, in Asian setting, we are very into the intangibles. Uh, that's what set us apart from the Western style of heritage site or heritage architecture. The spirit of the place is an important is as is important as, as, as the place itself. Another factor that we can summarize in this documentation is that the fact of the, the fact that these houses are adaptive to nature. They are used they are using local materials and cottage industries that such as Kauaian, Amakan, and so on. So if you could just focus on product development of these types of products so we can have uh, at least a supply of architectural product coming from the Philippines because 99% of our architecture supplies are imported. Okay. Another thing is that all of them are facing the sunrise. No? So it is very important and we have known this for generations and generations that we should face the sunrise. That's that's very um, practical because if the house is facing the sunrise, then the other parts of the house ca can become cooler because the winds comes from the north and southern. Lastly, our houses, the Mindanao house, has the element of reason. It has this element uh, that resonates from families from generations to generations of stories of the house. For example, in the Binana house, it serves as a metaphor of the Datu's achievements and thus, this, and thus of his entire family. This value is in each house because of the memories passed from generations to generations. To end, let me end by saying that Mindanao urban architecture and cultural design is an unending tale of aesthetic storytelling. Every corner of this room that you see holds a, a decor that interprets the stories of people making them and building and retelling memories. And as we flip our pages to the new globalization, we can say that if these memories and stories are retold in architecture and design, then, then we can indeed preserve them. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much, architect uh, Glory Rose de Metelia for sharing us information about your works related to uh, Mindanao identity, cultural designs, preservation. Now, um, for a quick review, we have four presenters for the session two. Uh, the first we have about the research and pilot study about ground routing for resource, agricultural resource mapping in Davao City. Presented by one of the Mindanaoan expert, Dr. Monte Castro. As Please uh, occupy the uh, the seats on stage. Uh, second paper presented by uh, Miss Maria Teresa Abogado. Uh, her groundworks, particularly with experience in uh, Marawi about resource mobilization. The third paper presented by our very own. Uh, Asik Romi, Romeo Montenegro uh, about the BIM Iaga opportunity for Mindanao to capture for business and international cooperation. And the uh, fourth one, uh, we have architect Glory Rose de Metilia, uh, Mindanao Identity uh, Cultural Design Presentation. So we have 
few minutes for the open open forum. Uh, there are four areas uh, that you may uh, shoot your question on. Please directly address your question to whoever that speaker would you like to ask. Any, okay, I'll get the first three there. One, two, three, both sides. So, isang babae dito uh, at the center, then number three kasi, kaapat ka ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC, Doc Alex. Yeah, MC, Mali uh, Miranda Campaner yun, okay there. <laughs> okay, uh, I am uh, Mr. Hukutan from the uh, representing the uh, Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners, uh, Davao City chapter. Uh, Davao chapter. I'd like to ask a question to uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Yu. Yu, uh, your presentation was very good. It is eye-opening, and it uh, is it tells us uh, many things about Mindanao and BIMP, of course. I'd like to ask about uh, something that you did not discuss. The CIQ is uh, customs, immigration, quarantine, and security. I will not talk about the CIQ. I will, let us talk about the security. Because security will even uh, hold or uh, backtrack the initiatives that uh, you have told the group what uh, what is the initiative of uh, BIMP Iaga as far as security because that is the concern of the whole world thank you uh, thank you sir boy <coughs> BIMP Iaga and particularly relating to Mindanao is very much porous in terms of border um, set up that's why um, the armed forces of the Philippines every now and then um, warns possible transition or um, possible entry of um, terrorist-linked entities from across the border. Uh, under BAMP Iaga and part of CIQS, the S is security. Um, on a bilateral level, there had been ongoing um, bilateral cooperation, um, border to border. In the case of Philippines and Indonesia, we have an active RPRI border patrol um, strengthening uh, ports and borders of both countries. Um, in the case of Malaysia, we have RP Malaysia. But BIMP Iaga as a whole, um, about three years ago, the three countries had signed a trilateral cooperation. Oh, two years ago, the three countries, um, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, signed a trilateral agreement on um, enhancing security across um, borders, um, which includes joint exercises, joint patrol. But in the last ASEAN summit in Bangkok um, last uh, July, the president in his interventions has again urged his counterpart heads of states in the BIMP Iaga to further um, enhance such cooperation. So uh, the Cabinet cluster on um, security and peace is set to convene um, in the next few days, um, along with MINDA and DFA, to already initiate um, a possible um, multilateral um, meeting with Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and Brunei in terms of looking at the progress of the cooperation in the aspect of um, addressing security concerns, especially in the areas of the Sulu Seas where as of yesterday, we just had an incident again of an alleged suicide bombing, uh, allegedly by a female foreigner, non-Filipino, although DNA um, tests are, are still being worked out to determine nationality of such um, um, suicide bomber. Um, a few months ago, um, a couple who are not also Filipinos um, uh, triggered uh, such suicide bombing incidents in uh, the Cathedral of Hulo. Uh, these are incidents and instances where the President has really highlighted the need to um, strengthen such cooperation. This is on top of every now and then high seas piracy happening along uh, Sulu Seas. Hindi lang masyado natin nababalitaan dito, pero uh, about three, four years ago, three years ago, not much in the last two years, Almost every now and then, may nakikidnap uh, from across the border, particularly 
sa Sandakan and Kota Kinabalu. May ari, there, was, may ari, there was a restaurant owner um, in Kota Kinabalu who was kidnapped. May mga fishermen din um, kidnapped, brought to our shores, particularly in Sulu. And these are definitely thorns uh, in, in our cooperation and in our relations with these countries and is always creating and validating the perception of risks, not just in Mindanao, but in the Philippines in general, but much more in Mindanao. That's why isang malaking kalaban and challenge natin sa Mindanao all this time is the perception. Imagine mo, 10 years ago, may nakausap ako sa Manila, tinanong ba naman ako, may mall sa inyo? Di ba delikado doon? And that was just 10 years ago. Yet, they still have that perception because every day in the newspaper and on television, what you would hear is kidnapping, bombing, uh, which are splashed across headlines and not much about what is good happening in Mindanao. Uh, and that's why security is a very important um, equation in the Bibiaga cooperation and this is specifically highlighted by the President in the last Iaga Leader Summit in uh, Bangkok uh, two months ago to make sure that the four countries are able to sustain the partnerships and um, address uh, irritants in terms of um, the cooperation, particularly in the aspect of security across the border. Okay, thank you uh, for that sharing uh, information uh, related to national security. Other information may be confidential. Uh, the lady at that side, wala. so number two, number three, kasi din. That lady at the center, please prepare. Ibong Kalimba po, Prime Minister. Uh, I would like to address my question to ASEC Montenegro about Bimpiaga. Uh, we have a problem of our uh, in our country of walking our walking the talk in mainstreaming our policy research into the uh, government uh, laws one of the main issues that you raise is about the manado Bito. the travel time and the i've been to these places and I believe that there is a problem of the Imperial Manila policy, like Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur uh, Imperial policy towards this uh, area uh, for controlling the economy for their oligarch. Now, in here, if we can have a concept of complementing borders, we, uh, our people are interconnected, like uh, the Sanger uh, in uh, Tahuna and the Sanger in Sanangani and Balut Island, wherein there is a regular connections. So we are connected. One problem is two regulated uh, connectivity and transport. Hindi, I don't know why it cannot sustain the boat uh, trade route between Manado and Jensan within the reach. I, I, I wrote that uh, 1997, in 1997, I brought my students to Manado. And that is the last time. So the problem here is it is not the people who does not want to connect. It is the government that bars us to connect. How would you change that policy from the Malacanang perspective in trying to allow us? Perhaps uh, federalism will uh, solve this, that we can napabayaan din ang mga sangir at saka mga maruri sa tahuna. Tula din ang mga taga rito sa Mindanao. Even in Sulu and uh, uh, Tawi-Tawi, the people there are interconnected. Their politician in Saba are pinsan ng mga uh, governor dyan sa Tawi-Tawi. So interconnected yan sila. Unfortunately, the government is always trying to bar our economic power. What is the initiative of Minda in trying to solve this policy? 
very specific bakit hindi pwede ang barko ng uh, Surabaya magdiretso dito sa Jensan or Dabao. What kind of uh, uh, policy that bars us? Kasi dapat pupunta pa doon sa Manila. Okay. Uh, another question is we have a strength napabayaan ng edukasyon ng mga sangir. Our Jensen is better in mechanical and agricultural engineering. If we can recruit and uh, allow our sangir Indonesian to study in MSU, we can produce professionals in that region that will soon become the leaders of Tahuna and Manado. And this will complement our borders. Is that possible project of the Bintiaga? Kasi yan lang ang pwedeng masustain natin in trying to uh, connect our people. Economically, Manado, Tahuna, Jensan, Dabao. Thank you, Bob. Okay, there are two sets of questions. Uh, Director Montenegro, lahat yon. Okay. First owner. <laughs> <laughs> Policy has always been a challenge for Mindanao because um, naturally our policies emanate, emanate from national capital. Whether executive issuances or via law, uh, dun niluluto uh, sa Maynila. But there's quick wins also and quick gains we had um, um, through the years in terms of being able to work out policies specific to the case of Mindanao. And we've been making use of Bimpiaga as a major justification. The travel tax exemption, 50% discount in ports and airports operations of an IAGA player, CIQS facilitation um, for Bimpiaga trading. Uh, in fact, bago nagkaroon ng ASEAN single window discussion, the four countries and the Bimpiaga many, many years ago already thought of harmonizing our CIQS rules, regulations, and procedures by coming up with a handbook common to everyone. So that if I am a trader in Jensan, the same checklist is being followed in Bitung, the same checklist is being followed in Kota Kinabalu in Sandakan Ports. So that's because of our understanding under BIMP IAGA. Yun lang, hindi natin siya na translate into policies. But uh, at, 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 at any rate, in general, these are being adopted by the four countries at the ports of BIMP IAGA. So meaning to say, our port manager here knows personally the port manager of uh, across the border. Our airport manager here knows the airport manager uh, in the counterpart, Bimpiaga Airport, for instance. Um, before, daanin ko lang weekly sa ganitong analysis. Um, our chief of police in General Santos, before conferring with the chief of police for, of Manado for a transnational um, crime, had to wire um, the Camp Krami PNP. PNP chief will have to inform our, M our DFA. DFA wires our embassy in Jakarta. Then Jakarta will have to notify our consulate in Manado. Our consulate in Manado will pay a visit to the, May to the, to the chief of police of Manado. But because of BMP Yaga, the chief of police of Jensen can directly call his counterpart chief of police in Manado because of this particular understanding. So we shortcut the process in terms of such a circuitous um, policy uh, framework. Um, why is it difficult to mount such um, connectivity? Number one, it is private sector driven. And private sector needs to see the viability first before it would want to embrace in such a capital intensive, for instance, undertaking. Yet through the years, however, many of the investors have seen the viability already. Yun lang ang naging challenge natin when the Dabao Jensen Bitong was launched no less by President Duterte and President Widodo back in 2017 in Davao. What was deployed was a 500 TEU vessel. Ang laki for a 100 TEU volume lang that is expected at the time uh, initially. Para bang Davao to Jensen na can be served by a small aircraft, dineploy is jumbo jet. So illogical. Kaya hanggang first voyage lang talaga siya because it would spend 10 million pesos for every voyage and then wala siyang karga. So had the private sector deployed a much smaller vessel, 
then we would have seen its viability already. Because many of the companies would want to ship or load their commodities, would like to see a three straight voyages bago sila mag-shift ng contracts in terms of cargo forwarder. They cannot just shift to this. And then after first maiden voyage, wala na palang kasunod. Then mahihirapan na naman sila. So that's why the next vessel that is serving now the route is actually now doing the service. Ang kagandahan nito, hindi lang siya two-point connectivity na Dabao, Bitong, or Jensan, Bitong. It's Dabao, Jensan, Bitong, Labuan, Labuan, Vietnam. Kasi pagdating niya sa Vietnam, siguradong may karga siyang semento at saka palay, uh, bigas, pagpabalik niya dito. Uh, going back to the route, again, of Labuan, and then Bitong, and then uh, uh, Dabao or General Santos. So we're still waiting for some other companies that have actually uh, been studying the movement of this vessel to now actually make use of this. Now, for the specific points that you have identified, um, small scale talaga siya. Uh, ang challenge lang natin because we are signatory to international laws in terms of um, certain um, policies relating to maritime um, activities. And so that, um, hindi ganun kadali mag-deploy ng vessel to serve this route without going through approval ng marina. Yun nga lang, si Marina, by virtue of Bimpiaga, has allocated a specific policy for Bimpiaga. May special permit for Bimpiaga vessel who would want to fly. Permit that will not require many other things because it understands the context of BIMP Iaga. So we have that facility made available through Marina. Ang tanong lang ngayon is, willing ba to risk itong small player? Because... Ito ang problema natin ngayon in terms of connectivity, mapa airlines or mapa shipping. Unlike many other investments, the investor would be willing to lose a certain percentage, for instance, of foregone revenue just so it could see the economic activity and the investments moving up, magpipick up. Yun namang air links and sea links, ayaw magpalugi. Gusto first voyage pa lang, may kita na agad, doon tayo nagkakaroon ng problema. Because these are private sector and um, profit driven. About uh, education. Education is part of the cluster on sociocultural education. And if you recall, two years ago, General Santos and Sarangani hosted the first ever Budayao Festival. It's a first ever convergence of culture from across four countries. And when they did one um, showcase, in one elementary school in Sarangani, yung mga elementary students, upon seeing the Bruneians, the Malaysians, and Indonesians perform, napatunga nga sila kasi sabi nila, pare-pareho lang pala tayo ng mga sayaw at kultura. So that is part of uh, an effort under BAMP Iaga to propagate the culture of understanding or understanding through culture among the four countries. And transitioning later on also to the other part of that cluster, which is education. Kaya ang idumpisahan ngayon muna under BMP Iaga is the TVET skills. So that um, BIP Iaga later on will be able to come up with the common standards in terms of technical vocational skills. Because kung pupunta ka ngayon sa Kota Kinabalo, 80% of the crew ng nasa hotel, mapa singer man or mapa nasa um, services or nasa mga mall, Pilipino. Kahit nga yung mga massage spas, sprawling across um, Kota Kinabalo, puro Pinoy. Okay. So we wanted these types of um, um, technical skills be um, highlighted under BIPIAGA cooperation, then moving on to specific professions na later on um, as, as a pilot under BAMP IAGA. Um, as far as uh, our brothers in that part of um, Sarangani, um, we understand that our Indonesian consulate in Davao um, in the last recent years has been very, very active in providing them the necessary support. Okay, thank you for that. Da, mayroon pa isang nakareserve pala doon. Sige ma'am. Anyway, that last question is related to education. Kapo kayo na yun sa kay sir. I'm Maluna Naman from MSU IIT. I think I will throw the question to all the resource persons for this afternoon. In the light of the theme of our forum, especially local action for Mindanao, how, how is this dialogue going on here, the conversations disseminated to the other more than 70% of Mindanao, and even so, maybe in the Philippines? 
because um, as we do in the peace work, there is this gap of uh, communicating good news, good actions, good efforts, so that everybody would be on board or on the level towards what is being done um, in relation to global globalization, especially here in Mindanao. Okay. That's my question for all so, the okay, resource so anybody could uh, answer the, the question or all of you. <laughs> Since I'm from the academe, my platform is really through the students. And I also teach in the graduate school and many of our our Doctor of Engineering students are from all over Mindanao, so it's like the multiplication of the bread <laughs> kind of dissemination of information. And in Ateneo de Davao, actually we have lots of efforts to disseminate our research to the Davao city community. So all our university research council funded projects are disseminated to the community, to the stakeholders. We invite the city, the and civil societies. So within Davao City, I think we have that covered. And hopefully through our graduate program, we also disseminate the information to others in Mindanao. But I think the forum does provide the venue for that. And PIDS, I think with their documentation, can disseminate it to the rest of the country. So okay, uh, there is an existing platform for dissemination. In fact, Minda, meron tayong Mindanao Knowledge uh, Center, and of course that is uh, in partnership with PIDS. All informations, kaya lang merong ibang institution na hindi nakapag-upload. Um, but that could be part of the ways forward. From our end, um, because Oxfam is also um, based in the Philippines and we have several programs in um, supporting Mindanao. So large of uh, big portfolio is on conflict transformation or sexual reproductive um, health. And the other one we have recently you know, uh, have also um, cooperated with PIDS on unpaid care work. So we have, um, uh, we leverage on different platforms. One, this is a very good uh, platform for us to share and transfer um, information that would be useful to seed a lot of this uh, new ways of thinking, disruptive maybe in a way, uh, to allow us to open our minds and think of new ways of um, looking at old things. Second is that um, we, have, we work with local partners and our local partners ranges from civil society, private sector, academic institutions, and also local government. Uh, we participate in different levels of um, coordinating bodies, supporting policy review as an evidence of, um, and also sustainability of efforts, especially practices not only in financial inclusion, but a lot of um, our support in reducing gender-based violence and um, social norms change. And, uh, as I was saying with uh, Asek Kanina, on also looking at how do we actually um, expand opportunities for people to access uh, financing, especially that a backbone of your good trading and commerce is really access to finance. Um, third is that um, we also participate in UN cluster meetings. So we have different layers of um, cooperation to disseminate good news practices. So by participating in um, cluster meetings at uh, UN level, we also look at international agenda and help shape this, how this could translate to uh, voice and re-echo local needs and context. Because at the bottom of what we do is to ensure that um, the voices of the people in the community are actually re-echoed, amplified through and, um, meetings with the local government or at international uh, level. And then um, lastly, because of um, little support that we also provide in communities and in Mindanao, we also support publication of researches or case studies and we distribute it in different platforms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, lang, sir. Um, in terms of message crafting, we bring down the level of understanding from conceptual theoretical <coughs> 
to actual reality. So, paano maintindihan ng mga tao ang bimpiyaga? Well, yung palm oil na in-example ko, uh, yung mga kinakain natin or chocolate or kape na inom natin. But there's another one, very um, related to the situation of General Santos. 100% of the 2,000 megawatts capacity coal that Mindanao is enjoying today, that's why you don't have brownout in Jensen, where 85% or no, 50% or 85 megawatts of 175 megawatts contracted by Socoteco is coming from coal-fired power plants, which is imported 100% from East Kalimantan, which is a BIMP Iaga area. And part of the discussion that the BIMP Iaga is looking at preferential tariff for us. Yun nga lang, we don't want to move further on this because coal is not necessarily clean. We'd rather move towards looking at um, renewable energy sources that we can share from our um, uh, neighbors across the border, like connecting Palawan from Saba, connecting Mindanao from Saba, because the Borneo has about 3,000 megawatts of hydropower plant, and yet, sobra-sobra, wala masyadong gumagamit. That's a cheaper source of electricity. Our electricity in Mindanao or in the Philippines is 10 pesos per kilowatt hour. Electricity there is 2 pesos and 50 centavos. Okay, for our critique. Uh, so uh, I'm a bit of a parang mic macro sister and then I'm in the mi micro, very grassroots. So the real challenge in really you know, delivering these messages to the 70% of the Filipinos is to really uh, make use a language that they could understand and not the language that are, we are using here. No? So um, one of the efforts that we have done is we have made uh, a toy, uh, of uh, an architecture toy that really simulates how the architectures are done. No? We started with the Maranao Torogan and it's really like, it's really a very tactile toy. And then we did, we did uh, exhibits in Marawi. Now, the good thing about this is um, British Council has helped us develop, and Air Asia has developed. A, Air Asia has helped us develop other toys for the different indigenous designs. No, so now yung yung proceso is that we have democratized the making of the toy. So, for example, yung tuga ng Mangwangan tribe in Compostela Valley. There's they're the ones who are designing the toy and making them, and they can see how. The Maranao, which is made now by the IDPs of uh, Samarawi, how they how they are doing it. So there is a cultural exchange of such in a in a very layman's kind of a process. So you know, nalalaman ni ni Mangwangan yung yung style ni ni Mar Mar Maranao, nalalaman niya yung style ni Atapakibato through the making of the indigenous toys. And I invite you to check it uh, out in our Facebook. It's called Balabale 3D. It's a very interesting way and somewhat innovative. So, ganun siya, no? Um, uh, the, the communicating these kinds of intellectual, um, you know, discourse is not easy, no? But um, it is our, that's why we are here, the industries who, who will, you know, will help us, help you communicate with that kind of uh, language. And I'm very thankful that we are here and there's a proceeding afterwards which will be way forward on how we can uh, really, really um, dig into the deeper of this uh, conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Be because of time constraints, uh, we will be forced to terminate uh, session two. Though we have a lot of information to be shared, but the main portal for that information, minda.gov.ph. Thank you very much. Daghang salamat, Dr. Al. Uh, may we request our speakers to not leave the stage uh, just yet. And uh, we call in behalf of Mindanao State University, Dr. Lawas, in behalf of PEDS, Dr. Celia, and uh, in behalf of Minda Asek Montenegro to um, award the Certificate of Appreciation to our speakers. And of course, Dr. Al, as our moderator, please join us on stage, sir.